Hello, my name is Carla Poole. I am an attorney. Um, I generally practice on the civil side. I don't, well, actually, I don't do any criminal law. Um, and I'm predominantly work in municipal court, but I do handle some family law cases, some court of common pleas cases, typically in the quiet title, civil side of things. Hi, my name is Michael Huff. Uh, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing this year is 25 years. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. Uh, I practice mainly in Philadelphia County, but I've uh, also uh, practiced in New Jersey uh, for many years, and I've in uh, state and federal. Okay, so the reason why I asked y'all to this meeting today is because I, we created PA Voter Court Watch after advocating with families who've had hardships with courts, with DHS, and families who are facing lifers who should be coming home because there's a new court, there's new laws, restorative justice, but these judges aren't doing the restorative justice and these DAs aren't doing this restorative justice. So how can we partner with attorneys who represent us to create a transparent and accountable courthouse? So um, first I would say you should switch that and ask how can attorneys partner with their clients because um, it, oftentimes what happens is that when an attorney takes on a case, they take the case. They get the facts from their client and then they go off and run it, right? And um, if attorneys could slow down and break down the process for their clients and explain to them what's going to happen and why and the risk at different points because a lot of people think that the legal system is black and white and it's not. It's very gray. It's based on these the facts, right? There is the law, but it's really about arguing these facts to the law in a persuasive way that is uh, that that the judges follow. But the but the thing is, there's this this side, this under. When we talk about transparency. There's this background information that often clients don't know. It's like judges' uh, tendency or personality types or um, styles that they like in their courtroom and if you don't do it the right way, you might actually inadvertently do something negative that hurts your client or just their political views that are um, creating somewhat of a bias. So even though you're arguing the law, they're working around the law to sort of get the outcomes that they want. So how do you partner? Um, one, as an attorney, oftentimes we're going to be risk first to call the judges out because we have to go back into their courtroom and ultimately that will hurt our future clients. But our clients can, right? Our clients can go to the news. Our clients can um, post things. You can't record in court, but you can talk about your experience, right? So if I teach, so I'll give a, a simple example. I teach, uh, I'm, I do landlord tenant classes, right? Teaching people about landlord tenant law, what the rules are, et cetera, et cetera. So if I explain to my client, this is what the law is, and based on the law and your facts, this should be your outcome. But I often have to tell them, however, if you go in front of this particular judge, more than likely you're not gonna get the outcome because this is what they hold to, right? This is their, so we're gonna have to try to either work around that or get a side deal, right? People can easily go on their Instagram and say, hey, this is what the law is. This is what my facts are. It's clear that this should be the outcome. Explain to me why the judge ruled this way. You see what I'm saying? So th those are different ways that we can partner by like really giving you information. You don't have anything there? Uh, I think that was excellent. Uh, everything that you said I agree with. Um, as far as transparency is concerned, I mean, courtrooms are open to the public, uh, so that means and there are always exceptions to every rule. So if you're dealing with like a juvenile matter, for yes. example, or it could be a juvenile court or you know family court. When juveniles are involved in court, the courtroom is closed and only family members are allowed to be inside, and that's to protect the um, you know the, the child in the case. Uh, but for the most part, courts are open, so go to court, sit in there, um, be a court observer, uh, watch what's going on with the cases. Um, you know, show up, participate. Um, and one of the other things, uh, nowadays, everything is electronic, okay? So when we, as criminal defense attorneys, receive discovery, now this, of course, is particular to Philadelphia. Every county is different. Pennsylvania, 
I can go off on a million ta tangents. Pennsylvania is very much county by county. Yes. Okay. So, for example, in New Jersey, New Jersey, where I also practice law, is more of a state, um, you know, judiciary. So, for example, if you're going to pay to file a complaint in New Jersey, the cost to file a complaint in Cape May County is going to be the same as it is in Middlesex County, and you make it payable to the state of, uh, treasurer of New Jersey. Pennsylvania is very um, dependent upon the county itself. So what rules that apply in Philadelphia County may not necessarily apply in Bucks County or Montgomery County. But Philadelphia County, as I was trying to say, was uh, we get our discovery electronically now, okay? And every defendant should absolutely have a copy of the paperwork uh, that the government uh, intends to use against them in court. And now with email, uh, it's just so easy for an attorney to download that information and then just email it to the client. And that's also important to get that uh, in the beginning of, of your case because if you get convicted and then you end up doing a significant amount of time in jail, I have clients all the time uh, who are on appeal or um, in post-conviction relief proceedings where the first thing I say is, do you have a copy of your discovery? And nine times out of ten, the answer is no. Okay, so you have a person that's incarcerated who is serving years in jail and do not even have a copy of the paperwork that put them there. That has got to be the number one priority, um, I think, for anybody. And, and defendants need to uh, ask that. Family members need to ask for that. And, you know, an attorney's got hundreds of cases, potentially, uh, or tens of cases, potentially. So I am always in uh, the practice of making sure that my clients and family members have the discovery because they are going to be reviewing that discovery um, a lot more than I am. And the reason that they're doing that is because it's their family member uh, who um, you know, is in danger of incarceration. Uh, and they, they may point out things to me that I didn't catch, or they may see something that um, is false that needs to be investigated. Uh, and everybody has a right to an investigator. Okay? In Philadelphia County, and the Constitution uh, case law provides that you have a right to have your case investigated. Okay? And if that just means going into the neighborhood and knocking on doors to see uh, you know, uh, if anybody saw anything, then have it done. Okay, because I'm, I'm going to speak generally here, but in my experience, you know, the, the way the federal courts prosecute the case and the way a, a county prosecutes the case is in, in, in totally different. The feds will investigate for years. Um, you know, they'll do a search warrant in 2016 and then make an arrest in 2019. They've been doing an investigation then. That's phone taps, that's GPS. They're going to cross every T and dot every I. And that's what we want from our law enforcement. We don't want our law enforcement just making stuff up. Making stuff up for sure, but also, you know, taking the least, you know, doing the least amount of work in order to get a conviction. And that's what I think I see more than anything, which means that the burden often falls on the defendant and the defense attorney to pick up that slack to conduct maybe a more thorough investigation to make sure uh, you know, that the facts as being presented by the government are in fact true. If, if the government, the police, or even the prosecutors are gonna hold back on discovery and not uh, pass over um, you know, exculpatory evidence, it's really hard for how, how do I know if that's what the government is doing? How do I know if they're holding back paperwork? I would never know that. We just heard on the news recently, Larry Krasner found six boxes of discovery Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, pertain to uh, um, uh, Mumia's case. I mean, that should never happen. Not when, uh, you know, uh, we have people that are incarcerated, wrongly convicted, that are serving sentences that should not be there. So I hope, I yeah, hope I, I answer some of the questions. I just heard this, along with that, I just heard a statistic from um, Brian Stevenson that one out of nine individuals on death row are innocent. And that's just death row. Well. So if we start thinking about all the other crimes, that's going to be far worse. Um, but some of the one of the other things that I wanted to sort of add on to this this conversation about partnership is um, so sometimes it's important if you know important people to have important people sitting in the courtroom with you, right? Um, because People are unfortunate. Well, so judges are people, right? And they are influenced by who is also sitting in the audience. So um, for the last year in municipal court, I was there every single day, right? That was part of my job for this program. 
and I could watch the judges and see. I learned. I got to the point where I could learn and tell someone, okay, if you're in front of this judge, you have to say this this way, and you'll get this outcome. If you say it this way, then you'll get this outcome. Or you're never going to win. Don't worry about it. Just appeal it, right? Um, then all of a sudden, someone who is going to write an article or someone who is doing a review of things will be sitting in the courtroom, and the whole atmosphere of the courtroom will change, right? It's unfortunate that it's like that. We need to change that. But you got to start where you are before you get to where it should be. And where we are now is you need powerful people in the courtroom who can say, wait a minute, what's going on? Why is this happening? That shouldn't happen that way. Um, that doesn't make sense because then it, it puts the judges on this sort of, they, they recognize that someone who knows better or is watching them and it might actually influence them or affect their position. Uh, also, just simply, judges need to start working full days. I just had to throw that in. Like coming in late and then leaving early. It's affecting your life. <laughs> and and uh, I, have a, I have a client whose uh, daughter was a heroin addict, was arrested. Um, and you know, I heard from the family, uh, the, what I always hear is that she doesn't need jail, she needs treatment. Exactly. And uh, what she did was she reached out uh, to Mayor Kennedy. And Mayor Kenny uh, responded, sent an email to the district attorney's office, and before I knew it, I was getting a phone call uh, from the from the district attorney about the case and finding out what they could do something wrong. So please use your elected officials. Um, you know they are they can be resources, and that's not just the mayor, but that's uh, your city council person uh, or your board member or your committee people. You need to get you need to get people involved. We heard it was a. An individual on Facebook posted something about being pulled over. His um, car registration uh, had been expired. Top towed the car, made him and a uh, family member walk home in the snow. Okay, that should not be happening. Um, the police should not be putting people at risk. The, pe the police are there to serve and protect people, not make them walk home in the freezing snow. And, and people feel powerless. Well, what can I do? What can I do? Well, talk to your elected representatives because that really, besides protesting, besides right. direct, direct, direct action, that's something that you can do. Now, um, also, we have to hold our legislators um, responsible. They write the, they write the law, okay? Yes. They, write, they write the criminal statutes. Um, they write the Pennsylvania sentencing guidelines. The family statutes. Why in the world are we assessing a criminal record? for drug, selling drugs to decide whether someone gets custody of their child, right? When they come out, we're not doing an assessment of these parents, but we act like there are rich people without criminal records who haven't ever abused their children, right? So it's, it's a very, like to, to assume you were bad because you have a record is a problem. But one, one other thing I want to talk about with partnering is telling your attorney the truth and being completely open. Um, I only did one criminal case, but the, the case that I did it was really important. At first he wasn't giving me all of the information, but when he started to reveal stuff, I was able to get him into mental health court, right? So we have veterans court, we have drug court, we have mental health court, and what I learned was that his drug addiction was actually to treat his, he was self-treating his mental health issues, right? And so, but he had a history of this, and I, um, had he not like really opened up to me, I really pushed him to talk to me, talk to me, him and his wife. And the more he explained, I found out this background about him that was really helpful. And it's helped me in my family law cases, in my landlord tenant cases. It's really important to know the whole story. But this is the funny part, but we as lawyers are always going to stop you and tell you to get to the point, right? So there, there's this, there's this tension. So sometimes in partnership is telling the attorney, I need you to hold up and listen to my story for a minute. I'm going to try to be as concise as possible, but I want to, so you can hear it. Because sometimes you'll say something that I didn't know would have been significant, and now it's a part of the case, right? Or I've had the, the other situations where my client didn't tell me anything until after we were in court, and I'm like, if you had told me, we would have taken a totally different path. We could have gotten a totally different outcome. And I'll talk about judges if I can just for a second. Sure. Um, you know, we are a democratic city, so that means that all of our judges are 
basically Democrats, right? So in, in other situations in other counties, you may have you know, Democrats running against Republicans, so you may be able to rely on their party affiliation to give you some idea of what type of judge they're going to be on the bench. Uh, you are absolutely right. I tell this to clients all the time when I'm in the courthouse that you know you have a trial in this courtroom and then have the same trial in that courtroom and you can get two different results. Two different sentences. Say, you, know, you know, everything, you have, if, of the same law, we have two different people. People, yeah. some people are conservative, some people are liberal. Um, some people uh, are, are, some, and, and unfortunately, I think a lot of those judges are still stuck in that, you know, tough on crime situation. Um, and they're not really, they're not willing to get out of it. I know that, again, when Larry, when Larry Krasner first became DA, there were a lot of, there was a lot of judges that were pushing back uh, against his reforms. And so you could have a DA that wants to in, uh, implement these reforms within the criminal justice set, uh, system, but you have judges that are saying, I'm not doing that. I'm not on board with this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we had one judge uh, here in Philadelphia where I think there was a, there was a violation of probation, but uh, the district attorney was not seeking you know, a detainer on the individual because that was the new, that was the new rule that was in the office. And if I was quoting the case, please forgive me. And the judge inside the courtroom basically said, okay, I am relieving this district attorney of you know, his or her responsibility in my courtroom, and there's a criminal defense over the, uh, attorney sitting over there. You are now the prosecutor of this violation of probation. So if we don't have not only the community and individuals in partnership with their attorney, but also uh, in partnership with elected officials such as the district attorney, but if they're not in partnership with these judges, then you're never going to see the change. You know, the change is just going to be stopped. If you have uh, politicians that are out there that are running on mandatory minimums, they're mandatory minimums and they still exist to some extent in Pennsylvania, but they were ruled unconstitutional as a result of federal court cases that came down. But you have certain politicians that are in Harrisburg that want to re-implement them. You have certain district attorneys who are Democrats in Pennsylvania who want to re-implement them. And we need to keep those out of the courtroom. Um, because you know it takes uh, discretion away from the judges. It also forces defendants into plea bargains where, where they know that if they go to trial, they're going to get five to ten years. The judge going to have no discretion whatsoever. They may, may be more likely to take a plea bargain of three to six years or two to four years or something along those lines. So it has got to be a partnership again. You know, from from the defendant in the case, their family, their attorneys, with your local politicians on a city level, with your state politicians, and with judicial candidates as well. So, yeah, I do have a question. So, my biggest concern is these judges are so corrupt. So when my families go in front of these judges, these judges already have made up their minds. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And as a client, they can't say, I don't want this judge. Can we get another judge? That's what we're looking for. How can we say we don't want these judges? Like, how can the attorney represent us and say, um, we don't feel like we're going to get the best representation. Is that possible? That's really what I'm looking so for. So in the family, in the family court se section of it, no. And, uh, some attorneys have some inside information. So when they're filing, they're able to file it with to sort of get the right judge that they want. But that's that's in a very rare situation. Um, my, it may not be a perfect solution, but one of my experience in family court, because I know exactly what you're talking about. You have judges that who, in their head, they've decided what the best interest of the child looks like, and they they judge an individual's parenting skills based on their value system, not based on whether this parent is actually going to um, do what they're supposed to do. So, um, what I encourage people is, if you're creating a group and a collective, um, with that there needs to be a fund attached to it. A fund to help people appeal the judge's decisions, right? Because family court, people often do not appeal to superior court. Either they can't afford the attorney to help them through the process to appeal, or they just can't afford the money that goes along with just paying for an appeal. But uh, a lot of people don't know this, that in family court, a large majority, the body of law for family law um, and from superior court and supreme court is very, very limited because the, that body of law comes from superior court decisions or supreme court decisions and families often can't afford to appeal. Right, so I'm going to give you an example. I, I had a case in front of a judge 
there's a rule that has been going, which is, uh, is called the Tender Years Doctrine. Doctor. Not allowed to use it, it doesn't exist. Tender Years Doctrine says that a father is not allowed to have, so you have to give special attention to the mother when the children are younger in a custody situation. That's the Tender Years Doctrine. So if a dad is seeking, um, seeking custody from a mother and the child is under the age of like five years old, the mother's going to get pregnant over the father. The rules are constitutional in the state of Pennsylvania, can't use it. So I'm in front of a judge, my client is the father, the baby is uh, less than a year old. The father was claiming that the mother's living with her, her father who abused her, and he's worried that his daughter's also going to be sexually abused, right? So he's asking for full custody. The judge literally says on the record, I will not give you custody of this child, you cannot have overnight as the father, right? It was like, Your Honor, Tender Years Doctrine is gone. She said, I didn't say anything about Tender Years Doctrine, but fathers don't get their rights, right? So that was something that we were like, well, what do we do? Do we do a motion to reconsider, which goes back to that same judge and it goes in writing, or do we try to appeal it? And oftentimes for the client, the timing that's associated with it because the children are so important, the timing of appeals takes too long, so they don't want to appeal. If, but as you know from your experience, especially with even with DHS and all the families you're dealing with, it still takes years anyway. So people are discouraged being discouraged from appealing the case because of timing, but you're still dealing with the same amount of time when you do a motion to reconsider, getting another hearing, coming back over and over again. So why is an appeal important? Judges don't like to be overruled by higher judges. They just don't, right? And the more they're overruled by higher judges, the more they start to get frustrated. Um, it's embarrassing for them to be overruled. So that would be my first step, is like creating a fund to make it affordable for people to appeal their cases so that they are being put back and checked by the higher courts. Nice. So um, uh, judges are supposed to be unbiased. Judges are supposed to be fair and impartial. Uh, I can tell you uh, from a personal experience, uh, this was years ago, it was a juvenile court in Philadelphia. It was at, at the time, the juvenile court was at 1801 Vine Street. Uh, now, of course, it's moved. Uh, but I had, uh, my client was a juvenile, it was a juvenile court. court. It was a uh, sexual type of allegation, not real bad, but it was, you know, it was bad enough. Um, and uh, my client was adamant that he was, he was innocent. Um, and the alleged victim of the crime was actually going around the neighborhood telling people that what he had claimed happened did not happen. Uh, and so it was a very important case to me. It was a very important case for my client and his family, obviously. And uh, I did what I try to always do is uh, be the first one in the courtroom. And I was. I was the first one in the courtroom. I think the lights were still out. Uh, and I was sitting there in an empty courtroom by myself, reviewing my file, preparing for trial in the, in the matter, and the judge walked in. And I wouldn't say who the judge was, uh, but the judge walked in and he said, Counselor, you know, who are you here for? Which case are you here for? And I gave the name of my um, client. I said, I'm here, you know, in that case, Your Honor. And he said, oh, I know what that case is. He's like, you know, those people don't make up stories like that. So he was basically telling me, he, was, he knew my client, name and he knew what the facts were. I was impressed that he had it from, you know, he knew at least about what the case was about. Uh, but then basically told me that he had already prejudged the case and that my client was guilty. So, you know, as an attorney, I would have been within 100% of my rights to stand up and say, Judge, I'm asking for a recuse. Okay? And I could have easily called out um, what he had said to me. And I'll be honest, I did not because I had enough faith in my case that I was going to win, despite uh, what he had said to me when he walked in. And we went to trial, and my client was in fact acquitted. In fact, we had, I called one of the witnesses who came in and said that you know, the, the complaining witness in the case had told her specifically that it did not happen. What he had said happened did not happen. The judge actually said, was anybody with you uh, when that took place? And she said, yeah, I was with uh, my girlfriend. I said, where's your girlfriend right now? She's like, she's in school. Sent a sheriff out to the school, brought her in, testified without any preparation whatsoever, basically to the same exact story that my client, um, my client's witness had given, and my client's found not guilty. 
and I, you know, I've, I've always carried that with me, and I always hope that you know that judge will keep that case in his mind. Uh, that please don't prejudge. But is there is there an avenue? Is there a rule of criminal procedure that allows for that? Absolutely, it's it's called recusal. Uh, you would file a motion to the court. Um, to ask the judge to recuse him or herself because, you know, either they have demonstrated that they can't be fair and impartial or that there is an appearance of uh, not being fair and impartial. So that just means because of their situation, well, we know that you're fair and impartial, but it just doesn't look good. And that's really what's going on uh, with the Bumina case, to bring it up for a second time, is that yet uh, again, from this quoting, people probably know a lot more than I do, which is what I know is what, from what I read about in the newspaper, accurate yes um, but uh, but you know yet uh, Rod Castillo who was the district attorney at the time of his um, you know trial and convictions and then was in the appellate courts and was reviewing the same case that his office um, had prosecuted and uh, the court of common pleas judge in Philadelphia said that's the that is that creates the appearance of impropriety mm -hmm. so people just don't feel um, confident in the conviction when you have factors that you can point to that may suggest that it wasn't fair, okay? Uh, and I think we need more of that. I think we need more uh, judges, you know, stepping out of cases. Even if, they, and you don't, again, you don't, oh, how dare you suggest that I'm, I can't be fair and impartial. You know, that's like an attack against their character. Um, but I think, you know, judges need to, you know, remove themselves in any situation where there could be that appearance of impropriety. Uh, and that even prosecutors can do the same thing and ask judges to uh, remove themselves from cases. And certainly defense attorneys can, um, you know, file those types of motions. They would, they have a burden of proving that there is either they're going to be fair and uh, unfair and biased, um, or that at least there's an appearance of that. And you know, and let's just give people a fair trial. I mean, that's the most important thing. Before you ask your last question, I just want to say this. So we talk about family court, we talk about criminal court. Some of these things are going to hold true for civil court as well. But I do want to mention municipal court. And the reason I want to mention municipal court is because there, um, when something happens in municipal court in the city of Philadelphia, it's if you don't like it, you have to appeal and it's trial de novo, which means it starts all over. Anything that happened here is just taken away. Here's the problem with that. So there's benefits to it, right? And some people say it's because you get to start all over with a new judge, right? The downside of that is the municipal court judges don't feel like they, they can do whatever they want, right? Because no one is going to overrule what they say. They can just do it, and oftentimes, people don't have what they need in order to appeal, so whatever they say is going to stay. So you have judges who have temper tantrums on the bench, right, who get up and walk out on cases, who tell, uh, who tell lawyers, shut up, I don't want to hear that, don't quote that law in front of me. And, and it's all on the record. I, I was in a case where the, the opposing counsel lied in front of them so that there was a gasp in the courtroom when it became very clear that he had lied, right? And I was like, Your Honor, you're going to continue to let that go? And he said, yes, got to put his hand on and walk out of the courtroom, right? Because he wanted to go home. <laughs> it, was, it was time for him to go home. So this one of the reason I'm going to hold this up. I created a form. This is just municipal court. It was just landlord tenant because that was the deed I had. But I was trying to show you talk about the appearance, just the pure appearance, right? So watching, looking at this, where most of the judges are ruling for the landlord and only four judges are 50-50, right? That doesn't make any sense for it to be 90-20, uh, sorry, 90-10, 80-20 for almost all of the judges in a landlord tenant case. And here's what's interesting. There's one specific judge who's very fast, who her cases are 50-50. And one of the reasons her cases are 50-50 is she'd walk into the court and ask them, do you have this document, this document, and this document? They didn't have all three of those documents. She's like, you can never win the case. So she would let the case go. So how does she have 50-50 and the other cases are 90-10? If she's adjudicating